and we are rolling. Um, Adam, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Doing well. Had my uh, had my every Thursday drive now. This is becoming nice. a good routine here. It's good. Going from upstate New York down to uh, good old New Jersey. Yeah. It's um, for those who don't know, today was a snowstorm last night. Adam survived, which is great. I so. did. Luckily, uh, now being up here, you have to have four wheel drive. If you don't, you just you can't. Four wheel or all wheel drive. Four wheel, all, all wheel. wheel. Actually, I have all wheel. I, I I still don't fully know the difference between four wheel and all wheel, but I have no idea. That's another podcast that, for another day. Uh, I think all wheel generally is automatic, and then four yeah. wheel you go from two to four. So like my truck has four wheel, but my father's Honda is all wheel and it's automatic. Okay, that's completely irrelevant. Yeah, let's get into why we are here, here. today. So on the rise, doing it. We're on the rise. We're doing it. So what I was thinking about in the drive over that I want to talk about with you, because I, I know at least for myself, I've experienced like this. I know you do too. For sure. And I'm sure really everybody has these types of experiences. And I think it's an interesting topic. So sure, hit me. I'm going to hit you with it. So number one, I guess, before we even jump into the real point is mm-hmm. what even made you want to get into the music industry? Sure. Um, so I think like I always tell people this, that... Um, it's like there's this this gravity, and I, I can't really explain what it is. I think those who are crazy enough and stubborn enough to do music, which I think is like the statistics of doing it professionally are just like not in your favor at all, is that music chooses you. You don't choose music. I, I just knew from – it's funny because it's not like I, I, I knew I wanted to be Grizzly singing. Produ- like I didn't know I wanted to do all that. Like it's not something I knew, but I knew – I knew at, at like earlier than 10 years old that I wanted to make music. You know what I mean? And I, I couldn't even explain what that was. It's a really hard thing to explain. I played several instruments, but I knew I wanted to create music. I knew that like from my mind, I wanted to make music. And that was just something that like just overtook my body for from that moment until now. I mean, so I mean, I think that that formulated more is in like teenage years into like writing songs and like doing stuff like that. And then from there, you're learning to play the instrument and you're writing the song and you're writing lyrics and then you're singing the song. And then, um, but yeah, it's not some romantic thing. I mean, you, you hear so much about um, like in the sixties, like everyone saw the Beatles on TV. It was, I forget what show it was. Everyone saw the Beatles on TV in 1962 or 64 or whatever it was. And then everyone who became a seventies rock star, like that was the pivotal moment in their life. There was never really anything like that for me. It was just, um, it was just this gravity to create. And I think I always tell people I'm not very visually oriented, but I'm very like audibly oriented. So like that became my Avenue. Um, so I'm going to flip it on you. So for me, it's music, but you, I think you're different because music's like a, an exact thing and it's an exact passion. Right. But um, in being a musician, I'm an entrepreneur and I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. And that, sure. I think that, ex- that ex- like I want to be other things outside of music that fall under the umbrella of entrepreneur. But I think for you, the passion was being an entrepreneur. And obviously you had a startup business that you were able to sell at a young age. So question for you, was that startup business the passion or was just being an entrepreneur the passion? And if so, if both, which one came mm-hmm. first? Great question. So it was a little bit of both, but even to take it a step back, when I was when I was a kid, like I always wanted to be something great. Like I wanted to be a professional baseball player. Then okay. when I realized that wasn't happening, <laughs> I was like, I want to be a general Genetics manager of a sports team. Sure. And then I did some internships. Well, and, the, you can't rule that one out. I mean, a lot of people enter that in their 40s and 50s. Sure, sure. But like I, I did an internship, a couple internships in college with baseball team because I was a it. sport management major and Got I did it. it and I was like, yeah. screw this. Like in order to get to that part in the field, you have to love every little section of working in the sports field. And I, I want to know part of it, but I'm a lot just, of, can I stop you for a second? Yeah, yeah. My question is, so if you're that passionate about baseball, right. And I know this from music that, that you have to love every little element of it too. Yep. Can you, can you just name like what in the baseball industry was the turnoff that was, what was the straw that broke the camel's back? Yeah, it was, I realized I didn't love it. I, I realized you had to eat, sleep, drink, absolutely fall in love with it. And I, what really broke the straw that ca- that broke the camel's back on that yeah. was I was doing an internship with the minor league baseball team in, in New York. It was the Hudson Valley Renegades. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't getting paid a dollar, mm-hmm. not a dollar. And I drive there every day. I was spending 10, 12, 14 hour days during their game days. And I went to go grab a hot dog. And I remember I came back with 
my free hot dog, which I thought was fair. Like I'm working, giving them 12, 14 hours of free labor. Mm-hmm. And they're like, hey, Adam, you got to pay us $1.50 for this hot dog. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, that's it. If this industry is that cheap and, I, and I'm looking at the people who I'd be – who. I would be elevating to. And I was like, I don't want to have this job. I'm not that interested in it. Um, And that was the big culmination into the next year in college. I took an entrepreneurship class by happenstance. I honestly didn't even know what the hell entrepreneurship was until that point. Okay. Fell in love with the class. The professor and I hit it off. She was starting an entrepreneur program. She hired me to be like the full-time CEO, intern of the program. And then from there, I was like, all right, I got to start my own business. Okay. So... If you were to put in one sentence, what's the foundation of that business, which is now sold, so you don't even work in that business anymore? Like, like I work in yep. music, or someone works in film, or you wanted to work in baseball. What's the? So the foundation of that business was we wanted to help college students succeed. That was at its core how it started professionally. Professionally, exactly. So we wanted to help the college students that were putting in the most. You know, the ones that are going above and beyond outside the classroom, we want to reward them for their extra effort. So that was our whole focus from day one. It changed a million times throughout the business. Sure. And it was something that it was a passion project for us. And it turned into a, you know, a decent little business. Um, but I've learned as time goes on, I have tons of interests. You know, like you are in love with music, but there's different parts of music that you're in love sure, with. Sure, totally. Like the production totally. side of it, the the writing side of it. Uh-huh. The sit, like I'm sure there's all these different parts of the music industry that you're falling. Totally, with. totally, totally. There's like a bazillion. Um, okay, cool, interesting. So I think I, I kind of want to backtrack. Tell me if I'm wrong. I think, I think the analogy I will make for you with baseball is like when a kid almost like sees like a rock star type figure or something like that, and they fall really, really in love with that. And then when it comes to getting into the belly of the beast, they realize it isn't quite what what they exactly. thought it was. But you, at a certain age, realize you love the hustle, mm-hmm. and then want to do apply that to a situation which was more rewarding. Exactly. So yeah. I, I want to actually dive back into you sure. with music because I think it's such a it's such a tangible thing that so many people want to do, just like being a professional athlete. Like everyone as a kid wants to be a professional athlete. But not everyone's Tom Brady. Exactly. There's very few. There's one. There's one Tom Brady. There's one Tom Brady guy's a legend. Yeah. Um, And that's coming from a Jets fan. Yeah. Crazy. We lived in Boston for a bit, so. That's true. Um, But yeah, like everybody wants to be a musician. Sure. So was it, and I know you said it was just, it, it seemed like it came very organically. But it wasn't like you're watching American Idol or you went to a concert or you met a, an artist and you were like, I need to be this. For sure. I think I think it's actually really similar to what you said about your startup where it's like it's like a very evolving thing. And even like it's like at 10 years old, I wanted to do this with music. At 13, I wanted to do that with music. At 18, I wanted to Mm. do that with music. At 21, I wanted to do that. Even me doing what everyone thinks I am doing right now, like I'm shifting like all the time. So it's like, it's like a constant, well, first of all, the the industry is changing. This is like with any industry. Mm -hmm. So the industries are changing like crazy. Um, but I think I think I was just so blessed that I just loved music. You know what I mean? And when you love music as much as anyone crazy enough to do it, like you're able to pivot. You're able to. I mean, I think we we always talk about like the I'm not gonna name any names, but like like the great producers who are able to last the test of time. I mean, I'm trying to think who was it? Was it uh, like Quincy Jones? He was a producer for like five. He dominated like five decades. And then you have like hip hop producers nowadays who have like these years, like one year where they reign supreme, and then then they're over mm-hmm. and it's really a, a game of adapt or die. And there's so many, so many legends in music that really just didn't adapt or die. And I think, I think that's, it's, it's easy to see that whenever someone's on top of the mountain that they, they were able to adapt or die. Mm-hmm. They were able to adapt or, or and flourish or they didn't adapt and they died. But the truth is like the bottom feeders, that's just the way bottom, like who are just maybe on the runway or not even on the runway yet. Like it's the exact same game. I mean, you have to call audibles all the time. You have to change and you have to pivot and you have to realize, you know, and, and, and I feel bad for people that maybe are just obsessed with one thing. Like they're obsessed with being this artist and this five batch of songs and they want to do it with this label and they want to be doing this and they... and it's just never going to pan out like that. So I forget what your original question even was, but I, I, I think it's all a testament that like, if you love it enough, you're going to pivot, you know? Yeah. You have to, with anything, 
I don't care what industry it's in, as you said before, sure. you have to pivot. Think about all these companies that you grew up with that are now dead or dying. You Netflix. know, even like I obviously Netflix every day. Yeah. Yeah. Like, totally different industry that everyone bet against. Everybody bet against it. You, I mean, GameStop obviously is very hot in the news, and they had a nice little rise. But for that's different obviously reasons, a different reason. Yeah. yeah, like everyone knows about GameStop because they're a dying company. No yeah. disrespect to GameStop, but yeah, when, when we sure. were growing up, that's where everyone went to go get their games. It's but true. if you don't adapt, if you don't continue to evolve with the times, you're done. Because every there are so many people that are at the bottom, that are hungry, that are willing to oh, fight for sure. and claw. And well, I think it goes it back to your hot dog thing. It's like it's like in music, I've done the hot dog thing a million times. Right. That's because I knew that's what I wanted. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like. Um, there are so many people five steps below you that can pass you in six steps exactly. by doing the, the, um, just by biting the bullet, taking the high road, you know? Well, I think that's uh, going back. We're going to use hot dog might be the, like the real yeah. center point of this podcast. Yeah, but it's I like, think it's Are true. you willing to, are you, okay, it's, it's $1 and 50 cents. Does it mean anything, but are you willing to pay for the hot dog or not? Like that's the exactly. huge analogy. Yeah. Find the thing that you're willing to pay for that dollar fifty hot dog. I think and, that, I, I don't know if I've mentioned this before on this show, but like there was like a one time I, I, I played like, um, I played like a three hour, played like a three hour, like private party kind of open to the public. To the, It was like, it was grueling. I played it early. It was the mid midday. I mean, I was drenched in sweat. My back hurt. I think I made zero dollars. So I had to pay for gas. And then I went to go pick up a girlfriend at the time from a country concert. I don't want to say who the artist was. And she paid hundreds of dollars for the ticket and got in the car with her friend and just complained the entire time oh, how they God. played <laughs> how they played ten songs. And for yep. me, rather than being bitter and being like, Why is he making, you know, a hundred K a night and I'm sure. getting paid zero, I was just like I was euphorically proud. I was like, well, at least I know I'm doing the right thing. Sure. I know if there were 15 people at that party I played, they saw me play for three hours and I sweat and made no money and I turned them all into lifelongers. You know what I mean? Well, and that literally is sweat equity. Sweat equity. That's literally sweat that's equity. Literally sweat so, equity. But then you go back to the hot dog thing. It's like if you, if you take the hot dog, if you pay, if you take paying for the hot dog in pride, then you're in it for the long haul. Exactly. It's a, it's a badge of honor. Um, exactly. With them, I was like, why the hell am I doing this when I don't even want I, This is not in true yeah. alignment yeah. with what I love and what I want to spend the rest of my life doing. So, yeah. So th that, that, that's helpful and understand. Like, I actually had no idea that that was even how you got into music. Um, even though it's not some like major epiphany moment, no, it's it's, no epiphany. It's just a gravity. Right. It's just, but but what I'm curious about now, digging deeper into that, and this is kind of the uglier, sure, sure. dirtier side. I don't want to say dirty; that's not the right word. But like more of the the less romantic. Yeah, the let. Thank you. Wow, you're such a lyricist. Nice. Hey, come on, that's good right. good for you. Um, the less romantic side that I want, and I know you want to talk more about in this podcast. Like we sure, don't want totally. to talk about the wins and yeah. the highs and, and just all the that. disclaimer: those listening into the podcast, me or Ad, me and Adam aren't anybody. That's why this is the rise. You know, we're not here to be gurus lecturing anybody on music or business we haven't accomplished jack shit right but we're here to just discuss so anyone else trying to enter the conversation maybe we'll have a nugget for you or maybe let me the hot dog thing will do it for you maybe. but yeah so we'll talk about the ugly stuff what, what exactly are you asking yeah and, and real quick on that actually like that that is the whole point of this is we want to focus in on we're we want it we're we're, we started at point A, we want to get to point B, and all this stuff here is the good shit, and we want to be talking to the we people. We just want to document it, exactly. Exactly. I and think I'm in, I, I, know where, I don't know about you, but where I want to get in music or professionally is maybe a thousand times mm -hmm. farther than where I'm at now. I mean, I'm super proud of where I'm at, but I want to get a thousand times further. So we're just doing this to document, and we'll be bringing other people on to uh, talk about kind of the same thing. Um, so yeah, sorry, what was so, your question? So anyway... What I'm curious about, and mine will be a little different because mine's a specific business, but for you, what was there a time, and if there was, what was the moment where you were like, fuck this, man, I'm, I'm ready to tap out? Um, Yeah, I can definitely think of like one exact moment. I mean, I'm really lucky, I'll just, the disclaimer, I'll say, I'm really lucky to say that I think I've really only had one of those moments. I've never never thought about not doing music so i'm really 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 lucky and i did i started doing it professionally young enough that i was able to make it happen at the same time i will say i've done tons of other jobs i've been on atlantic records and worked uber i worked at a sub shop i've done 
lots of other jobs while doing music. And in music, I do a lot of other jobs outside my artist career still to this day that I use to further fund my artist career. Um, but in terms of like just giving up and saying, I can't do it anymore. Like you're ready to go get a job. A yeah, I mean, I, I want to keep this as short as possible. But um, I mean, I think it wasn't even like me thinking about getting a job somewhere else. It was just me, but it was like, it was just, like, like hands in the air, like I gave up. You know what I mean? It was just really tough. I mean, I don't want to... I don't want to shit on anybody, but like my situation with Atlantic Records was we just we weren't releasing music and there was no talk of releasing music and there was no talk of making maybe hypothetically better music. There was no there was no there was just no conversation. I mean, my a &R disappeared for five months at a time once you couldn't get a hold of them. I mean, that should be enough for any CEO to fire that person. Mm -hmm. Instead, that guy got a promotion. You know what I mean? So it's like it's like at that point when you're. When you and then the funny thing is, I would love to backtrack. I think the year before this this moment, I I wrote some like I think I wrote if you know my catalog to those listening, I think I wrote Dance of Darkness, Take a Sip, Young Man, Because It's Wrong, Rattle Your Cage, and like one more, all in one year. So it was like it was a really good run, you know what I mean? Like I thought I did at, at that era, that was my best, you know what I mean? And I mean, there's a there's plaques in the other room to the to show for it. Um, but at the time, the music wasn't out, and we didn't know, and I just thought it was great. And no one told me it wasn't great, but no one told me anything. Mm. You know what I mean? So I think there was a point where um, we were going to release one song with Atlantic Records, Tipping Point. And um, it was just a tough time. I don't want to over, 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 over speak here. But streaming just wasn't a thing. It still was still it was becoming a thing. But even if it was a, whatever it was of a thing, I wasn't welcome. I know I wasn't welcome and I had no way of becoming welcome. And I just didn't know what to do. I mean, I knew that when we put it out, it was just going to flop. Why did you know it was going to flop? There was no one there to listen to it. If there was no marketing support and there was no curator supporting it, and my fan base at that time was only a few people, it, it wasn't Give us enough. a time frame in terms of what year was this, roughly? 2015. 2015. And Spotify and the streaming services were not big at the time? They weren't anything they are now. They weren't anything they are now, let alone making rock with trap drums. It wasn't rock. It was pop, and I wasn't big enough to be pop. I was, so like it just wasn't... In some ways, I was too ahead of my time and said I was, I was just too out of the box. I wasn't popular enough to force anybody's hand. I mean, kind of where I'm at now is where I became for my, 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 what's the word I'm saying? My plan or how I did it was that I just organically became popular enough to force people's hand. And that was kind of my, my, my method, you know, the whole time. And that took years. I mean, that I, I, I can't say anything went viral till the end of 2018 and i think i've known you for years before then yeah I think so it took a really long so okay so but i was doing it since 2014 so it took right. a really long time of um i'll give credit to my lawyer charlie who's a good friend of mine he said essentially just like the, if you build it they will come philosophy and for a kid who was stuck in a record deal where we were kind of out of money and we had no idea what the future held for DSPs and we were getting no communication. And also if we released music and it blew up and I did the, I went rogue and did it, I owned none of it and I wasn't making any money. So the main thing about my model was if I released music on my own, at least I was making 2K a month, then 5K a month, sure, then sure. whatever. And I was able to fund myself. I wasn't getting that. So there was like, it just seemed like a, a cycle that made no sense. You know what I mean? So, and, and let alone the fact that like you tell someone like you're going to release music for three years and you're never, you're never going to get a pat on the back. But eventually it's going to work. You know what I mean? Right. And that's kind of where I'm at now, too. Like, I'm so lucky now where I release songs and I get millions of streams and we're getting all this support. Um, shout out to people at Amazon, Spotify, uh, Apple Music. But, like, even then it's the same thing. I'm like, I need to chip away at this for three more years to get to that next level. And uh, there's always something scary in the unknown. So I remember just one point um, upon the release and just kind of getting phone calls back saying that no one, no one wants to support the song. And that, and what does that mean? No one wants to support the song. Basically, say like they don't want to back thing. it. They don't want to put more money behind it's it. It's not they a don't... money thing. Money didn't really do anything back then, unless it was radio. But that was no one's going to radio. It was just more like Spotify. I mean, um, Spotify, Apple, Amazon. Like none of them wanted to get behind the song. Basically. Yeah, exactly. So, and then the song ended up winning the the international songwriting competition like a few months later, which everyone who's won has gone platinum with. How, how does that happen? I don't know. It's an anomaly. 
So like who, right. Like who found that, who, what organization found that, but Pandora and Spotify and Apple music or any, I mean, I, honestly, I'll be, I wouldn't be surprised if the people at Atlantic records never even reached out. Right. Yeah. Like, honestly, like I'll tell you one thing when I release a song, I mean, I'm personally calling everybody, you know what I mean? Of course you're hustling. So I don't really know, but th- there was a moment I just remember sitting on my piano stool and just being like, I have no idea what to do. And the sad part was there was no, like I called everybody and I was like, we're going to figure it out. And, th- and there was a, an attitude shift, but there was, there was no solution. It literally was just a centimeter of progress every single day into getting out of the deal, which took six months and then releasing music and it flopping and then releasing music again and it flopping. But then seeing some of the older songs get a little more popular and a little more popular until something finally went viral, you know? And what was that song? That what was that? That was Dance with Darkness. Went viral in, in uh, like November 2018. Interesting. And you, basically, for you, you were. But just even like, at that time, at the caliber of viral, I remember bringing it to people in the music industry, and they're saying, you know, it was like, it was like thirty thousand streams a day on Spotify. Just isn't enough. You know what I mean? It isn't enough to matter. So know? walk me through even like when you sit when you sit in one of those meetings. Sure, it's even phone calls, not or a phone call, whatever it is, in person phone call it doesn't matter. Like what what is, you're basically you hop on the phone. Sure. You're like, hey, did you listen? They're like, yeah, I listened, or I listened to some of it, or I think sure. it's great, or I don't think it's like, is it bullshit? Like, are they just telling you what they think you want to hear, or are they shooting you straight? How, how how does that conversation happen? I mean, it's like they shoot you straight. No, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus here. Um, it's like I think when people reach out, like I know a lot of the European live industry reached out, and they they were super interested, and once they find something they don't like, then immediately they change. That's kind of the way it works, where they realize, like, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus here. They find something in your organization they don't like, or they find something about your track record they don't like, or they realize this success is just way too new, you know? And then there's like, oh, well, we thought this. Well, now we think this. Bye. You know what I mean? Or it's like, this is brilliant. Like, I remember someone saying, like, this is brilliant. And then I'm like, okay, great. Let's do a show in Austria. Right. And then they're like, oh, we can't because your middle name's Jacob. You know what I mean? Or right, like, right. you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's essentially that relevant. Um, but, uh, what I love is like, you, you got to have such t- tough, you know, thick skin, skin yeah, if you're going to be going into, sure, sure. I mean, really any of these, it's like when you go in shark, it's like watching shark tank, sure. which is similar to being, you know, in a situation oh, where for sure. people to your face literally saying like, this isn't going to work because right. X, Y, Z, you know, like Mr. Wonderful, anyone who oh, watches shark can't... tank, they're like, this business sucks, burn it, throw it, throw it away, start something new. And I'm sure artists hear that all the time. And some end up making it after oh, that for sure. and others don't but it's like you got to look inside yourself and say all right do i actually have what it takes to make it and am i willing to go through all the dirt that it takes to get there yeah no i mean i can i'd say in music people in shark tank are probably more intelligent than people in music i would assume but people in music really don't know anything i mean that's the astonishing part when you say they don't know anything i mean like astonishing industry or do you mean anything about even just music in general more so music big ones music but more so what's going to work and what's not. You know what I mean? Which is why music has become like s- pretty much strictly an analytics business at this point, which I think is for the better. But the problem is then you just, when it becomes an analytics business, you just perpetuate what's already working. That's the problem. Sure. Yeah. Then you Whereas, just like, copy The funny thing is like, ba- I would love to talk about this more, but like back in the mafia days, like in the sixties, when like when it was like all the mafia that ran the music industry and they just had so much money and they were like, they weren't music people at all. They were like the cigar smoking, super conservative guys in suits. And they weren't like, they weren't thinking about music. They're like, you, 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 mm-hmm. 100K, 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 go. And that was all they did. Now it's just like, I mean, you know the types. People we went to college with, you have internships and then they live in Manhattan. Sure. And they work up and they just like, they want to act like they're the smartest person in the room. They know everything about music, and they're like, it's like, mm, the face tag kid's working. Like, we need six more face tag kids. <laughs> right, right. It's like, right. that's exactly what you should not be doing. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, talk to me. Did you have a moment where I thought about giving up? Yeah, oh, then my... I'll talk one more. You did give up. And something a little more. Yeah. Yeah, no. Well, so we had our company for... Five years. The first year was basically an R and D project for what was our original business that turned into our main business that we ended up selling. Sure. 
So when we first started the company, I did it. I started with two other co-founders, one of which he was a good friend of mine. We went to school together. We did a one-year MBA together. We like did everything together, very close. Mm. The other gentleman I met, um, he was an alum in my college, five years older than me. And we met um, through the entrepreneur program I, I started. Gotcha, gotcha. So the three of us started the company. We went full steam ahead for a few years. During that time, we ended up hiring two more people on the tech side who we ended up calling co-founders. So we had five co-founders. Okay. By the time we sold the company, it was myself and one other co-founder, the alumni of my college who, uh, you know, we've been partners ever since and amazing relationship. But anyway, one of the co-founders who I was very close with, we had to make the tough decision to fire him. Oh, wow. And a lot of people don't know, like when people hear about co-founders getting fired, I hear a lot about how is that possible? How can you get fired from your own company? Yeah. But it's a, it happens more than people even realize. So if you want me asking about throwing your guy under the bus, mm -hmm. why? Two main reasons. One, results. Okay. And then two, he was, in our opinion, becoming uh, uh, not I'm trying to think of the right way to word it, but basically the, the culture fit wasn't there anymore. Got it. He was becoming, in my opinion, abrasive Talk and just kind of going his own way, just solo path and not in alignment with the rest of the team. Sure. Um, so anyway, I remember going into my, I was in the office on a weekend. It was my co-founder and I, the one that obviously I'm still working with. And he said, yeah. hey, Adam, I think we should make this decision. After speaking about it, I was on board. We called in our CTO at the time. He was on board. We made the decision. And then, you know, the next day we had to let him go, which was an incredibly difficult thing, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, but the reason why this is related to when we almost quit is because things started to get a little bit ugly where sure. there was some threatening of, Resentment. you know, you know, taking as much of the company as possible. And in, in startups, there tend to be uh, terms where you have to work a certain amount of time in order for your stock to vest. So even right. when you start a company, let's say you have... 25% of the company. Mm -hmm. Year one, you get a quarter of that. Year two, you get half of it. Year three, you get three quarters of it. Got and it. year four, you finally get all of your equity. Got it. It's all vested. And he didn't get all the time. So we let him go about two years into the company. Gotcha. So we all, the three of us, had two years of vesting. So we all had half of our total equity. Okay. Him and his lawyer made the case that he should be due his full equity. Gotcha. And I remember I was like, I work like a dog, like seven days a week, always in the office. And this was one of the few times I left. Like I took a vacation. I went to Hawaii to visit my dad who, sure. who lives in Hawaii. Yeah. And I'm in Hawaii and my business partner calls me. He's like, Adam, so-and-so, you know, their lawyer said that they're going to get full equity. I spoke to our investors. They agree. He probably is going to get his full equity. And what do you want to do? So basically we had to make the decision. We can either buy him out for an insane amount of money. Or, but you didn't see that coming. You don't think? No. Okay. Or we could basically work for this guy. We only had half of our equity vested. He had his full equity vested. And basically we, for the next, however many years are going to be working to make this guy a lot of money. And I'm just like, fuck that. That ain't worth it. Fuck that. No shot in hell. Am I going to do that? It's just a tricky situation. Yeah. Long story short, their attorney was totally wrong. It's great. We had. Hey, that's an interesting story. That's great. We had the worst attorney of all time. The word, like we had the worst attorney. Like, I kid you <laughs> not. Like he was, at, and he's a very smart guy. I'm sure it is very well for other people. For us, just, he just didn't work out. I think we must owe him money. I don't think he charged us for anything. That's like hilarious. he just was so aloof. Like I, I, he was just so bad. But I remember my co-founder and I, we were like digging into this problem. Like, dude, there's no way that he should get his full equity. So we're digging into everything in this contract, researching it. And we're like, there's no way. But our investors who are incredibly smart are like, no, he's probably going to get it. Like that's just, that's how it is guys. I'm sorry. And we're like, no way. So my business partner calls our attorney and he explains the situation, reads it line for line. And our attorney's like, yeah, what are you guys worried about? He doesn't get his full equity. And we're like, you sure? He's like, yeah, I'm sure this is pretty obvious. So thankfully he didn't get his full equity. That's a good story. Um, but you know, we took care of that situation and we ended up, you know, having the company for a few more years and that's great. Had a got acquired and it worked out for everybody. And, and you that's know, great. the gentleman who we let go, I'm, friendly with him. Greg, you know, I wish him the best. Very good guy. Uh, nothing wasn't but love for him. Time, Just man. wasn't a good fit at the time. Exactly. Right. Well, cool. Very good story, man. We're going to get going. Okay. Let's do it.